Good morning, everyone. I'm Nan Anderson with the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity and have been working with the Main Street Program for a few years now. Want to welcome you to our monthly Main Street webinar. We so much appreciate um, the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement working with us today. We're looking forward to hearing all about the different divisions and their initiatives. A couple of housekeeping announcements. We will be recording this session, so please be sure to mute your microphones. Um, we will be placing that recording on our website, business.utah.gov, um, probably early next week. As always, please place your questions in the chat. Uh, we will have time dedicated towards the end of our time together to address those questions. So I'm really excited today uh, to hear from the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement. Uh, they have been a strong supporter of Utah's Main Street program since its inception as a pilot program. Tracy Hansford has been a fantastic member of our working committee and continues on with us today as a member of the Main Street Advisory Committee. So we're going to hear again an overview of DCCE with all six divisions. And here to help start us off is the Deputy Director, Kat Potter. And after Kat, we're going to hear from all the different divisions. So Kat, welcome. Thank you, Nan. Uh, and good morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a lovely morning. Um, it, is, it is great to be here with you all. And I, I just want to say the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement is um, really thrilled to be able to work more closely on the Main Street program. And, um, and we see so much alignment between that program and so many of our divisions and the work that we do. And we hope that you'll learn a lot more about all of those divisions today as you hear uh, from each of them individually. Um, but we recently went through a strategic plan. And I just want want to let you know um, about the, the goals that we identified as uh, overarching goals for our department in that strategic plan. And I think they resonate with this program and with um, perhaps many of the needs in your different communities. Um, and that was to create opportunity. The first goal was to create opportunities for community understanding and civic engagement throughout Utah. The second is to ignite curiosity, creativity, and passion for learning and service. And the third is to preserve, protect, and activate Utah's historical and cultural treasures. And we think um, so many of our divisions cross into all three of those, um, all three of those goals and really um, can help um, as we move forward with Main Street. Um, so again, thank you for letting us be here to talk with you all. Um, I am the deputy director of the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement, and we have a team that works at the department level, um, in addition to the staff of our uh, seven divisions individually. And I just want to let you know about a couple of overarching projects that we have at the department level that we're managing. Um, and you are probably well aware of some of them, um, but we are working as the department is staffing the commission to uh, look at redesigns of the state flag. So we have been uh, doing a lot of engagement in communities throughout the state to get information about what re represents Utah and what represents all of Utah. Um, and that process, the, the public engagement and public submission process closed April 30th. Um, and we'll be going through um, over 4,000 submissions. I think we have almost 5,000 submissions for flag designs and almost 2,000 submissions of information, values, symbols that represent Utah. And we'll be sorting through those over the next few months, working with committees. Uh, some of you, I believe, sit on some of our subcommittees um, and choosing, uh, narrowing down all of those designs into um, a finalist and finally one design um, by the fall. So you'll be seeing a lot more information as we go through that process. Um, we also are working um, very closely as a department on uh, developing a new museum of Utah. We're the last state to have a state history museum and that will be located up in the Capitol complex. Um, and we are again doing engagement statewide to make sure we're telling everybody's story um, and that the, the Museum truly reflects all of Utah and um, and captures everybody. So um, so again, you'll you'll probably hear a lot more about that if you haven't already. 
And finally, um, and state history might also talk about this, we are working on America 250, which is the national commission to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and over the next few years, uh, we will be hiring a staff, part-time staff member who will help us form that commission, which will include representatives um, of all different groups, again, uh, representing our state. Um, and our goal is to present events, programs, um, activities commemorating this anniversary um, in all of our counties. So um, those are a few of our department-wide projects, but I will leave it to our divisions to talk more specifically about programs that each of them are doing um, that will be impactful. And so I am passing this on now. Thank you again for your time. I'm passing this on to Chris Merritt, who is our State Historic Preservation Officer. Thank you, Kat, and uh, thanks everybody for joining today. I'm on the clock, so I will move quickly. So um, as Kat said, I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer for the state of Utah. And what I'm hoping to share with you today, if it, of course, now it's screwing me up. So there we go, is a very brief um, overview of our programs. Um, so this is a federally designated office. It's uh, state historic preservation offices exist in all 50 states and three of our territories. Uh, we have tribal historic preservation offices, about 200 of those nationwide that do similar work. And this came out of the 1966 Historic Preservation Act as a way to deploy state level programs to forward historic preservation needs. And so our office is actually 60% federally funded, 40% state funded. Uh, we are going to be leading out in the transition to moving Main Street to CCE. Uh, Roger Roper, who you all know, is on my team, and he's been uh, a fixture in the Main Street program, and he's going to help us transition this with all of your help. Uh, our office is normally in the Rio Grande Depot. Uh, we are now in temporary offices for at least the next year to two years due to the earthquake damage, but we hope to return to that office space because it is a, a true symbol of historic preservation, and it's such an icon of Utah architecture. So in my few minutes, I just wanted to talk about some of our programs. Uh, so we have a bunch of programs uh, that mostly are federally mandated, but we've supplemented with some state programs over the years. Uh, the first one that you probably mostly have learned about, because many Main Street communities are already certified local governments, which when that 1966 law passed, it was an effort for our office to create local partners. So not try to do everything from the state level, but to empower uh, town, cities, and counties to deliver their own historic preservation programming. We have 99 CLGs in the state of Utah today. All you need is an ordinance and a commission, and that allows us to pass through grant funds to you. We're required by law to pass through 10% of our budget uh, to certify local governments. We generally do 16 to 18% pass through, uh, just because we have so many local government partners. You probably also recognize the National Register Program, those really cool plaques, uh, historic districts in almost every one of your communities. Uh, we have a dedicated National Register reviewer that can help a community find a you know, contractor and find ways to list either individual buildings or whole districts. Uh, many of your main streets are probably National Historic Districts to begin with, but there's probably a few gaps that we can expand on, but we can help guide you through that. Um, once you get something listed on the National Register, then we can deploy some historic tax credits. We actually manage the federal program, which is for commercial or income producing properties. Uh, that's usually a hefty investment, but we do also manage a state tax credit for residential properties. And so in some communities, you can leverage both the federal and state and really give a developer or a business owner a way to recoup some of their costs, but also helping to maintain the historic uh, integrity of those properties being rehabbed. And we have a person to help guide through that. We have obviously technical assistance. I'm an archeologist. So if you dig up some old crap, I'll be there to help you. Uh, but we also have a licensed architect on staff. We have our national register coordinator. We have other archeologists. We have other architectural historians. These folks are at your disposal at no cost. And I know many of you have already worked with them on projects. And then uh, on the more uh, boring end of things, but on the cool end, we maintain the corporate database of all known archeological or historic buildings in the state. Uh, the historic buildings in particular for you is probably the most interesting, and all of that data is online. Uh, all the spatial data, GIS, so if your planning departments need to get cuts of data, uh, we can provide that. Uh, we have 120,000 sites in our database or buildings, um, and we're getting all the paper records that accompany those scans. So we're working right now to get all of Salt Lake County uploaded, Utah County's already uploaded. So please reach out if you have some interest in either the spatial information or some of the other data. 
We do also have a pretty good outreach and education wing. We do have a public archaeologist who does a lot of outreach. He was critical in getting the governor's PSA on the pledge to protect the past, getting people to protect our cultural resources wherever they lay. But we also have a, a fairly good presence um, to push your projects out so you can get some notoriety. So please loop us in if you've done a really cool thing and we can help boost your message. And then in my last 50 seconds, um, we do review and compliance. So we work very closely with UDOT and other state and federal agencies that you might be interacting with because they are, do have requirements to uh, protect cultural resources and we're here to help them guide that. And then in the worst case scenario, if you find human remains in your community, we do have two forensic anthropologists uh, that can help recover and analyze those remains uh, and to give a respectful repatriation if they are ancient Native Americans. So thank you all. Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Thales. I'm the uh, assistant director for the uh, Division of State History. And, um, you know, history is essential to our understanding of who we are and, um, and the world in which we live. And so we've realized that um, for most folks, our website is our front door. And, and so I just wanted to um, highlight some of the resources we have on our website. Uh, more than 500,000 people use our website annually, and that's history.utah.gov. So one program is the National History Day Utah uh, program that offers teachers and students a powerful program to develop their research, writing, organizational, and public speaking skills. And that's a program throughout the state that takes place where teachers or principals are champions. Uh, we have two uh, resources, I Love History and History to Go, that are very popular for students. The Utah Historical Quarterly was established in uh, 1928 and is the state's official history journal. And you can search for past issues on our website. So that alone has somewhere about 400 articles uh, related to Utah history. Our cemeteries and burials program allows researchers and the public to access more than 725,000 burial records from more than 400,000 participating cemeteries. Uh, we also offer some small grants uh, related to uh, cemetery records and preservation activities. Our library and collections program has thousands of digital historical photographs available. And so you can go online and do a search for you know, your community, uh, famous Utahns. It's very broad. Uh, we also have an online catalog that you can search for books and manuscripts and pamphlets and other, other resources. Uh, this team also manages the state's collection of historic artifacts and documents. Our research center is temporarily closed. It, it closed uh, last week and will be closed for a few months. Um, and that's because of the, the, the earthquake that Chris mentioned, you know, damaging the Rio Grande Depot. And so our team has been temporarily packing up and moving uh, these materials to four temporary locations as we, uh, we get ready for the, uh, the new Museum of Utah to open its doors in 2026. Uh, we also have an annual history conference and this year it will be in Provo on October 26th. I would also add that if you have history related events, activities, let us know and we can help publicize them. We'd be happy to do that. Uh, so again, our website is history.utah.gov or feel free to contact me directly at kfayles at utah.gov. Thanks so much, hope to hear from you. And now I'll turn the time over to uh, James Toledo. Thank you, Kevin. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to um, present about my office. So um, my name is James Toledo and I'm with the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. I'm the program manager for the office. And so I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of my office and kind of what we do and um, the type of assistance we are happy to provide. So the, my office was created in 1953 when the Utah State Legislature passed the Indian Affairs Act, which created a commission on state Indian affairs. And then over the 
decades it evolved into uh, a full-on division where we are currently housed within the um, Department of Cultural and Community Engagement. Um, our first director was hired in 1956, and today our office is staffed by um, a, a mighty team of three. We have our director, Dustin Jansen, myself as program manager, and Dominique Talahaftua, who is our administrative assistant and also serves as our cultural liaison. So she's been interfacing a lot with the tribes in regards to the um, Museum of Utah, as well as the state flag initiative to capture and ensure tribal voice voices are included in that process. Um, the mission for my office is to um, provide positive government intergovernmental relations and the government to government relationship between the state of Utah and Utah's American Indian tribes. And so I just wanted to give a brief overview of the tribes um, here in the state of Utah. Um, so we have eight federally recognized tribes in the state, and I'll just kind of go through geographically where they're located. So north, um, the northern part of the state near Brigham City, we have the north, Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. Um, they've recently relocated their offices to Ogden, Utah. Um, and then to the west of Salt Lake City, we have two tribes. We have two Goshute tribes. We have the Confederated Tribes of Goshute, which is located along the Utah-Nevada border. They're located about 60 miles or so south of Wendover. Um, and then just west of Tuwela, we have the Skull Valley Band of Goshutes. Um, to the east of Salt Lake City, um, in the Uinta Basin, we have the Ute Indian tribe of the um, Uinta and Ore Reservation. Um, this is the second largest land-based tribe in the United States, so um, after the Navajo Nation. And then in south um, western Utah, we have the um, Paiute Indian tribe of Utah. So the Paiute Indian tribe of Utah is comprised of five independent bands. Um, so each band has their own governing bodies and elected officials um, that make up the council that oversees the, the tribe's businesses. So they are located in several counties. Um, we have the Kanash Band located near between Fillmore and Beaver. We have the Kusharan Bands located near Richfield. Um, near Cedar City, we have two bands. We have the Cedar Band as well as the Indian Peaks Band. And then just west of St. George, we have the Shivowitz Band. And then in southeastern Utah, we have the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Um, so the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, their larger land-based reservation is located in um, southwestern Colorado. But there is a small community south of Blanding called the, that we call the White Mesa community. Um, and then just to the south of the San Juan River um, is the Navajo Nation, which is, you know, is in Utah, um, uh, Arizona, as well as New Mexico. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of the, the eight tribes and kind of where they're located geographically in the state. Um, next is just kind of focusing on how can we help on your initiatives. Um, the first um, item where we, we are happy to help is introduction meetings. If your cities or organizations are looking to partner with tribes or even just explore, you know, what are the possibilities, we're happy to make these introduction meetings um, with you. We're happy to sit in on these meetings and really facilitate and provide assistance um, as much as needed. Or we can sit back and, you know, let, let you guys um, take control, but we're happy to set up these meetings. Um, we also have um, Utah Tribal Leaders meetings. So we meet six times a year where we bring um, elected leaders from the eight tribes. We'll meet six times a year. And really this is an opportunity for state agencies to provide updates about any projects that they're working on, funding opportunities. Um, we also do extend invitations to other organizations or municipalities who want to partner with tribes or you know, let them know of um, any opportunities. So we're happy to, um, make some time on um, our tribal leaders agenda um, for presentations. So you would have 20 minutes to kind of have a presentation and, um, and really it's just an opportunity to open that door for dialogue. Um, we're also happy to provide tribal consultation training if any of your boards or city councils or, or you know, organizations are just wanting to learn a little bit more, how do we consult with tribes? What are, what are the best ways to do that? Um, we're happy to provide that training. Um, our director, Dustin, is really good at, um, at, at walking us through this and really breaks it down in, into simple ways of how we can, um, how to engage with tribes and what that process is like. And the last opportunity I just wanted to highlight is attending our um, annual Native American Summit. This is a great opportunity to either be a vendor or have an exhibitor space if you will have information to share. 
or really if you just want to, you know, experience and start um, networking with tribal leaders and other members within the Utah's American Indian community, the summit is a great opportunity for that. Um, we generally have about 500 attendees that attend this event. It's really a very, it's a unique event in that we bring state leadership, tribal leadership, community members um, together to really focus on um, Indian affairs issues or issues important to, um, to tribes. And so again, as you look at your um, plans with the Main Street program, you know, this is a good way just to kind of introduce yourselves and just start networking. Um, and that's really um, a good way to, um, to kind of open some of those doors. And so that's just kind of a very brief overview of what we do. Um, here's our contact information. If anyone has any questions, uh, you know, you would like to meet more one on one and kind of learn more about what we do and how we can help out. Um, we're happy to to sit down and, and have those discussions. Um, and so um, our contact information is there. And um, thank you again for this opportunity. And next, I will pass the time on to Mike Mood. Thanks, James. Um, it's kind of a game of hot potato this morning a little bit, isn't it? Um, I, I myself am learning so much information about our sister divisions on this call. So, so I hope it's useful information to you and um, certainly want to express gratitude to those that have presented um, so far for your information because it's personally been really helpful for me. <laughs> Um, my name is Mike Moon. I work with You Serve Utah, um, um, another division here in CCE. And uh, Tracy, I indicated that I wasn't going to share my screen, but I am actually going to, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, so I will share all of these links in the chat. I apologize for accidentally sharing them a little preemptive um, as soon as I'm finished. But um, my task is in the next five minutes to share a whole lot about what we do. So my goal is to give you breath and, and explain ways that you can plug in with our division and a lot of different programs and not necessarily depth. So if you would like some depth in any of the programs that I'm going to share today, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk in more detail with any of you about the program. So buckle up, here we go. The first thing is our community engagement pathways. This is a brand new um, framework for the state of Utah in which individuals in the state of Utah can take an online assessment and find out how they can best make contributions to volunteerism um, within one of six pathways. Um, it's a really unique way to approach community development and volunteerism. We're really excited about it. And uh, we've developed some really great resources around this framework. The next thing is, um, volunteerism. So You Serve Utah acts as the state's central coordinating body for service and volunteerism. As such, we provide resources for individuals to get involved. Um, so um, on this page, you can see that both for organizations, um, information on how to recruit and post opportunities for volunteers, as well as for interested Utah um, members, people that live here in our state, how they can uh, volunteer. The next is we offer a program called the Community Engagement Network of Utah. This program is uh, really unique and similar to the Main Street program. Uh, we, in a regional fashion, gather people around the table who would like to see volunteerism, community engagement advance in their community. And you can see the broad range of people on this webpage that can participate. Right now we are in the Southeast region um, and our next meeting is next week, next Wednesday in Moab. Um, but we will roll out statewide in the coming years. Uh, so you can watch for that. Next is AmeriCorps. So You Serve Utah exists as the Utah's Commission on Service and Volunteerism. Essentially, uh, for a state to access federal resources for AmeriCorps, 
a commission like ours needs to exist. So a commission like ours exists in 49 of the 50 states. Um, and we are your resource in, in state for AmeriCorps programming, um, which is a really great federal grant for you to bring on uh, people, the personnel, um, employees, um, volunteers, <laughs> um, to assist in uh, volunteer programming. Um, in your region, in your area. So you can see our current um, uh, programs on this page. Again, I'll share all of these links um, in the chat. Next is our community engagement grant. So we do offer some funding resources to the state. Um, this funding resource is really unique in terms of it's less focused on like what the initiative is and the impact of the program and more interested in what is the impact of the program on the volunteer. So it's to increase the awareness of and participation in community and civic engagement in Utah. So we're focused on how are you recruiting expanding, uh, providing volunteer opportunities and educating those volunteers on how they can continue to be an active member of their community for the rest of their life. Um, I've got the Zoom controls blocking all of my tabs, so I'm having a hard time going to the next one. Next is we offer a program to recognize volunteers. Um, this is the Lieutenant Governor Recognition Certificate. It is free of charge and we would love for you to use it if you have volunteers to recognize. Essentially, you can indicate for a volunteer recognition certificate to be sent to you or to the volunteer directly with the state seal and the Lieutenant Governor's signature on it. It's a really great way to recognize and hopefully retain volunteers. Next, we offer training. So if you are using volunteers at your organization or your space, we offer volunteer management training. We also offer a change theory um, course called the Organizational Change Volunteer Management Training. Uh, we also offer disaster training on how to manage volunteers in disaster. Um, so check out those resources. Next, we do offer um, programs for youth around the state, um, a youth council, as well as the active engagement retreat to help encourage youth and train them to how to most effectively move a cause forward or an initiative or an issue of public concern forward. Next, we are um, engaging in a statewide listening tour to help inform our next statewide program, um, or our statewide plan for what the next three years looks like, essentially our strategic plan um, for state volunteerism. So if um, you would like to join us, we would love for you to. We've tried to make it as um, geographically accessible as possible for you to join us for a listening tour. We will also offer a public survey um, that is available to everyone. Finally, uh, we are um, continuously looking for ways that we can roll out new programs. This is a new program that will um, enter the state next year, wherein we're finding ways to recognize and encourage um, younger people in our state to um, volunteer even earlier and offering a recognition program for them uh, to engage in volunteerism in high school. Lots of information, uh, I apologize, um, but look forward to connecting with you if you have other questions. And I pass the time on to the next person. <laughs> I think it's me. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so um, hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Heidi Fendrick and I'm the State Data Coordinator at the Utah State Library. I'm also a library consultant for the Utah State Library and um, we help support libraries in all of the cities that Tracy mentioned that might be here today. So Brigham City, Cedar City, Helper, Mount Pleasant, Ogden, Price, and Tooele. Um, So at the Utah State Library, we have five programs. So the Program for the Blind and Disabled provides free braille and audiobooks for people who either permanently or temporarily cannot read or use conventional printed materials due to visual or physical limitations, such as blindness, a visual disability, a physical inability to hold a book and or a print disability. Um, this includes people in private homes, nursing homes, hospitals, schools, and other institutions. We also have the library resources program, which supports Utah's libraries and librarians and promotes access to library resources through interlibrary loan, 
lender support, um, book club, book sets, government publications, online resources, and more. Uh, we have the library development program, which supports Utah's libraries and librarians um, through the involvement of library service through training, grant funding, consulting, youth services, outreach, and more. Um, the consultants on our team offer public library directors, library staff, and library trustees professional advice and technical assistance to plan and evaluate library services for um, the certification and recertification that we offer to public libraries. We also have the Utah Bookmobile program, which is provided through a cooperative contract with um, state library and then the local counties or cities. So they provide a full library service to citizens living in rural sorry, rural communities, including Garfield, Iron, Juab, Kane, Paiute, San Pete, Sevier, Wayne, and Utah counties. Um, we also serve the city of Vernon and Tooele County. So we have five bookmobiles, which are headquartered throughout the state, making service available Monday through Thursday at over 200 stops. And then um, we have our digital access and education program, which assists in the development of digital access and education resources and standards for libraries. And we consult on broader digital access and education policy. Um, we also coordinate grants and other funding opportunities to strengthen local digital access and education ecosystems by empowering libraries with training and facilita facilitating connections with partners, including K through 12 schools. Um, some of the training that we offer includes um, continuing education and professional development opportunities, especially for, especially for rural library staff who can often feel isolated from professional development opportunities. Um, we also train library uh, trustee members, so board members across the state, um, and that's through our Uplift program, which stands for the Utah Public Library Institute for Training. We also do, or sorry, this includes mini, work, mini workshops, teleconferences, and grants to individuals and library organizations. I'm trying to talk really fast to keep it under the five minutes. Um, our youth services program provides resources, programs, training, and services to librarians and library staff serving children and young adults in public libraries throughout Utah. Um, so this includes our NASA at My Library program, which um, allows libraries to receive resources, training, and support through NASA, uh, which is a STEM education initiative that um, increases and enhances STEM learning opportunities for library patrons throughout the nation, including geographic areas and populations currently underserved in STEM education. We also offer um, summer reading. So the Utah State Library is a member of the Collaborative Summer Library Program, or CSLP, which is a nonprofit charitable organization that supports literacy, education, and science through summer reading events in public libraries across the United States. And then we also administer the Utah Kids Ready to Read program. So the mission of Utah Kids Ready to Read is to provide information, training, technical assistance, and resources on emergent literacy for parents and caregivers, Utah librarians, and their community partners. Um, so some of the funding opportunities that we have, they come from two sources. So we've got the Library Services Technology Act or um, LSTA funding. That's through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And these grants are intended to help libraries develop their central roles as community builders. LSTA funds are used to promote, promote improvements in service to all types of libraries um, to facilitate access to and sharing of resources and to achieve economical and effective delivery of service for the purpose of cultivating an educated and informed citizenry. And then we have um, our Community Library Enhancement Fund, which is CLEF funding that comes directly from the state. Um, and all public libraries that fulfill the requirements for state certification are eligible for this Community Library Enhancement Fund. And that money can be spent on programming, collections, ADA compliance for buildings and technology. Um, none of these funds can, that we offer can be spent on capital expenditures or building improvements, and the average age of Utah libraries is 50 years old, so just, just keep that in mind when you're working with your libraries that their, their buildings are aging. Um, so then we have, through those programs I mentioned earlier, Utah's online public library, which is a 24-7 online public library to all Utah residents. All you need is a card from your local library. So this includes OverDrive audiobooks or Libby, if you're familiar with that, um, magazines, research databases, test prep, learning courses such as Excel, 
um, Heritage Quest Online, which is genealogy research, news, um, all sorts of newspapers, and then Utah newspapers, dissertations and thesis, theses, theses um, and more. And then Book Buzz is our program that lends out book sets to book clubs, book groups, and libraries, organization, any organization, school, community center throughout the state. We do interlibrary loan. If um, some of our smaller libraries don't have a very large collection, they can get an item from any library in the state and sometimes outside of the state. And then we maintain a collection of publications created by the Utah state government agencies, boards, commissions, and other government entities. So it's subsidized by public funds and the publications are meant to be widely available to the citizens of Utah. And the Utah State Library is the central depository of all official state and digital and print publications. And I know that was a lot, but um, if you have any questions, here's my contact information and I will pass the time over to Claudia in Multicultural Affairs. Perfect, thank you, Heidi. Let me share my screen as well. All right, can everyone see that? Perfect. You sure can. Thank you. All right, so um, like Heidi mentioned, I am Claudia Loiza. I work for the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs as their communications and community engagement coordinator. And um, I'm here to share a little bit more about our signature programs related to serving our multicultural communities in Utah. Um, we are one of the only divisions in state government um, uniquely positioned to advance equitable opportunities for our underrepresented communities here in the state of Utah. Um, and we do that in partnership with many different state divisions within our department and then also um, different agencies within our state system. Um, our director, Nubia Fenya, is the um, senior advisor on equity and um, opportunity for Governor Cox. So we're um, very plugged into conversations around policy, um, statewide training, um, and we also work in partnership with um, grassroots community partners that are um, serving frontline needs within different cities, counties, and, and local areas. And we've been engaged in this work for 10 years. Um, this year is our 10 year anniversary of the formation of our organization, and um, we're excited to continue that mission. Um, some of our pillars um, include these three, number one being um, youth development and engagement. So um, that is something that we um, host through signature events annually for middle school and um, high school students. And the goal with that is to establish pipelines to higher education and empower youth to be agents of social change. So I'll detail a little bit more about that. Um, we also offer training resources for um, state organizations and state partners around um, equity and cultural awareness. Um, and then we also have our community outreach pillar, um, which include partnering with, partnering with local organizations to cultivate programs and resources for community needs. So um, starting off with some of our key commissions, um, we currently host two main commissions that are codified, including our Martin Luther King Jr. Human Rights Commission, um, which is a 13 governor appointed commission. Um, we have um, opportunities within this commission to apply. So I'll share the link in, our, um, in the chat here after I conclude, but some of the priorities um, are hosting community conversations and discussions through what we call um, a King Conversation Series, which is um, community events that we host throughout the year um, related to kind of expanding on um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, principles of nonviolence and um, different conversations to build on the um, topic of equity. And we've also promoted the Many Stories When You Taught MLK license plate, which is a signature license plate that you can purchase through the DMV actually that again um, furthers Dr. King's mission. And within the commission, we have three different committees. Um, we have our Emerging Leaders, Social Justice and Sustainability and Development Committees. And um, they're very closely related to um, the King Conversation Series and the, just the different external programs that we host. Um, again, this is a governor appointed commission, um, but we have um, some open seats. So if you know of anyone or interested in applying or learning more, um, you'll be able to do that in the link that I'll share. And then we have our multicultural commission that is kind of our policy um, commission arm where it, they partner with state agencies to ensure equity and access for um, intercultural awareness um, and building up programs and services. Um, and they are currently developing a strategic plan to identify some goals and deliverables that'll impact the needs of vulnerable communities. So um, that's something that has kind of come about because of COVID-19 and we report directly to the governor's office. So um, the Multicultural Commission is um, constantly partnering with different organizations locally to um, advise on reports, provide some direction or suggestions in terms of policy priorities. So if that is also of an interest, um, our website will have all the information for that as well. 
Um, another group that we have that just recently formed is our COVID-19 Multicultural Advisory Committee um, and our One Utah Council on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Access. So these two additional groups aren't currently codified into state code, but they do advance um, our um, vision for equity and um, thriving opportunities for communities through um, a kind of COVID-19 lens to um, alleviate some of the growing disparities that COVID has um, exacerbated. And then our One Utah Council on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Access is currently working on um, some statewide alignment on equity um, through a framework that we're providing and hopefully going to be releasing in June. Um, and then we're also um, working on some professional development networks. So um, that's something that statewide we're trying to plug in different agencies to participate in. Um, and there are some training and resource opportunities as well if um, any of your local government organizations are interested in that. Um, and like I mentioned, one of our pillars again is youth leadership. And these are the three events that we host annually um, for our middle school students, which is our Youth Leadership Summit. And for our high school students, we have Youth Leadership Day and Lead Southern Utah. Um, so these are very targeted to a specific audience, as you can see. Um, we've been hosting them virtually for the past year and a half or so um, due to COVID-19, but we um, do have quite a high attendance um, statewide throughout these events. And our Lead Southern Utah event is a little newer and it's um, targeted specifically to communities in rural Utah. Um, so we'll have information again on our website for how students can um, work with their educators or their schools to participate. It is free and it provides some youth leadership training around, um, again, building up pipelines to higher education, um, and then also to, um, I know you serve does this a lot too, but providing some impact and social change. Um, and then one of the last things I wanna highlight here is our um, just training resources and development um, pillar where we have some ongoing efforts again to um, provide assistance and trainings and um, workshops even for different state partners and um, state organizations. Um, so we have a few different tools, as you can see here, including a 21 day racial equity challenge for senior leaders that our department is currently going through and um, something that we've tailored slightly for different agencies as well. Um, and if you do have any questions on how this could apply specifically to your organizations or anything in terms of consultation around how do you advance that vision for equity in your or own in your own organizations, you're, you're welcome to contact me for those unique requests. Um, and then, sorry, this is the last slide I'm going to share. We have a grant currently open um, called Multicultural Rural Mental Health Grant, which um, is primarily for um, supporting mental and behavioral health agencies and organizations um, and serving um, historically and systemically marginalized communities and specifically within rural areas. So that is open um, through Friday, May 20th. And um, there's two different grant tracks that folks can apply through. Um, we'll have one. Um, that is specifically for um, grant awards of $50,000 and others that are up to $100,000. Um, but the eligibility information is here and you'll be able again to um, research all that information on our website. But hopefully if you do know of any organizations or know of any you know, connections that you, that you may be aware of, of um, needing some grant assistance in supporting these specific communities, please um, direct them to that. Um, and as I close, again, thank you for your time. I know that was a lot of information. We're going to continue throwing more information your way. Um, but yeah, please feel free to contact me, um, Claudia Loise. You'll see my information up here. Um, and then also my colleague, Jenny Howe, who wasn't able to join us today, but she is also quite um, adept and really an expert in a lot of these topics as well. So I'll leave this here and put my information in the chat. But um, with that, I will pass it on to um, the next presenter. And that would be me. My name is Allison Spencer. I'm happy to be with you guys today. I will also share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Can you see that okay? Give me a head nod. Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Tracy. So I, my name is Allison Spencer. I oversee the nonprofit side of the Utah STEM Action Center. Uh, we have a private public partnership with the STEM Action Center, and we are in, we were put in place in 2013 to oversee and be a state resource in promoting science, technology, engineering, and math. And the way we do that is we've identified best practices uh, in STEM education. We have a teacher uh, conference every year for over 500 teachers where we leverage resources and work with different aspects of industry, government, and community partners to give out resources to the community that are needed in their specific areas. So our main goal is to bring 
stem to all of you, not just in the K-12 uh, day, but in the community as well. Um, so the STEM Action Center was incepted in 2013, and in May of 2016, we filed for a 501c3, which we had legislative approval to do so. And we're so grateful for that because a lot of the things that we do involve industry partners and companies that want uh, students and adults to come and work for them. So just to give you a highlight for the foundation, since I'm repre representing today, is our pillars are to help in social justice. We have to be equitable statewide and offer to everyone in the state. And we try to identify needs in areas where there are underserved populations. Um, we try to work with companies to work on job shadow opportunities, speaking in classrooms, uh, funding to our events, and exposure to what jobs are available to students that they may, they or their teachers have no idea. There's so many incredible STEM jobs in the state of Utah, and they keep growing. Uh, we also highlight girls. We've worked with uh, girls who code the past few years. COVID put a little hinder on meeting personally. We used to have an entrepreneurial challenge uh, that was sponsored by one of our industry partners, and we look forward to doing more of that uh, this coming year. And some of the fun things, just to let you know, during COVID, we worked with Micron and many um, schools across the state of Utah that have 3D, 3D printing labs to print PPE equipment for hospital for students, for classes statewide. And it was amazing to see, um, as many of you have in your organizations, people step up and help donate towards some of these efforts. Um, one fun thing in the last two years is we finally have an actual STEM action center where students can come and play in our innovation hub. And so we look forward to offering tours. We host robotic teams that come in. We have 4-H clubs. We have an open tinker time every Friday um, until 8 p.m. And we welcome any of you to come in and check out the many opportunities that we have that are all funded by donations through industry partners and foundations. Uh, some of the things that we fund are innovation incubators. This is classroom or competition grants to teachers and students, whether they're going to a first robotic challenge or they're just a teacher wanting to level up their STEM. It doesn't, they don't have to be a math teacher. They can be a sewing teacher that wants to show the aspect of STEM involved in the classroom. And if they come up with some, something innovative and they apply, we have those grants available. So I will share this information at the end. We'd love for you to pass it on to your community so that they know about these funding opportunities. Uh, we also receive legislative funding to help with math enhancements, we send out to learn kits to community. This is for uh, preschool aged and, and more kindergarten age students that these are take home kits that they can work with their families, but they're fun. They involve painting or engineering. And we've had a lot of input from um, industry partners on these as well. Some of the things we've partnered with other agencies that spoke today are our STEM spots, which are lending libraries that go throughout the state of Utah. They look like your neighborhood library, but they are stocked full of STEM books or STEM equipment, some of our to learn kits. Um, and we are trying to be as diverse as possible in finding really educational books that hit a lot of different um, genres. So we welcome any feedback as well. So these are some of our programs we have, the Innovation Hub, we have our industry coalition made up of industry partners. Uh, we are also part of the STEM Equity Coalition and work to find ways and that we can do better to be more inclusive statewide. And we most recently started a podcast called How Did You Think of That with Temple Grandin that is great because we have a lot of uh, guest speakers in the field of STEM nationwide that are joining um, and you can take part in listening to that. Uh, I'll just wrap up here. I know we have limited time, but STEM in Motion program is formerly known as our Utah STEM bus program. Uh, one great thing we expanded is to be able to have kits that go into the classroom with a tutorial for teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, can now have these for a longer period of time and they don't require us being in the classroom, particularly during COVID. Um, as, we, as I mentioned, we have math software um, 
enhancements for teachers. We are part of an AmeriCorps grant that was spoken about earlier where we have math mentors that can go into the classroom and help with students and their math and hoping to bring those scores up. We have a lesson library and then we offer many events throughout the year. I mentioned our teacher uh, conference. It's for over 500 teachers statewide. We also have a STEM fest every fall that over 15,000 students come in two days. It's crazy and wild and many of you participate and it's a lot of fun. Um, so we would love it, any of these opportunities that you want to hear more about or how to get a STEM spot or maybe a hydroponics program down your way. Here's our contact information. Uh, we'd love to connect with you as well. And thanks for letting us present. I'll turn it back over to you, Tracy. Thanks, Allison. I'm Tracy Hansford. I work for the Division of Arts and Museums as the Community Programs Coordinator. Um, Allison, if you would, th there we go, sorry. Um, and there's my screen. We serve all sorts of organizations that are arts or culture or museum-based organizations all across the state from our smallest to our largest. Um, and we have programs in, again, museums. So that's um, all sorts of collections from botanical and zoological to your local history museum, like your daughters of the Utah Pioneer Museum literary arts, visual arts, folk arts, public art, performing arts, and arts education. Um, we have grants, which is what everybody wants to know about is where is the money, right? Um, for all sorts of nonprofit organizations, but we also grant to municipal governments, schools, and individual artists. Um, our project grant is our, actually open right now for just a few more days. Um, and it's a great opportunity to fund like an arts festival or an arts event um, from an organization that is not necessarily just arts based. Um, we also take parts of our large state collection out into communities, into schools, hospitals, libraries, or other community based venues. So you can have really high quality art out in your community for a very low price. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is that we recently started a creative aging program. So that's arts for older adults. And I see many of you um, are from communities where we uh, funded a program. So that's Brigham City, Vernal, Cedar City, several in Salt Lake City here. Um, we, the best way to find out about our organization besides our uh, website is from our newsletters. You can sign up for our newsletters on this website that I'm dropping in the chat. Um, I want to go ahead and um, open the floor for questions to all of my marvelous colleagues from the division or the department cultural and community engagement. Um, does anyone have questions for any of my amazing colleagues here? Hi, this is Scott Phillips in Cedar City. I, I think that the information is just overload. I think we're all trying to process. There's so much information that's been presented. You're you're absolutely right, Scott. Thank you so much. And I'm going to share contact information for all of us here. And so if you have any questions, please reach out. And if you're not sure you've reached the right person, we'll get you to the right person. Let's see. I think Paul had a question. Yeah, I've got two questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> the first is uh, just what is uh, DCCE's plan for staffing of the Main Street program? And then the second one is what is the department's understanding of what the Main Street program is? You know, Paul, we are working on uh, the staffing question right now, but I want to reassure you that it, the program is in really good hands. We're working as a team between me and Chris and several of the folks at SHPO. We're dividing many of the duties right now. Um, and there's a lot of questions about the future of the program, but that transition is going to be smooth. And um, we're working with NAN and we'll be reaching out to the National Main Street Program to make sure that we are fully informed and ready to pick it up as of July 1st. 
And then just like I say, the follow-up question is because in the in the hearing where the bill was presented to move the program from economic development over to DCCE, the comment was made that the Main Street program is a, a preservation and beautification program, which to me said that the director really did not know what the program is. And so I'm wondering what is DCCE's understanding of what this program actually is? You know, I, I'm not sh sure where that comment came from, but we do understand that there are four very different facets of the Main Street program. And, and we're trying to um, make sure we address all of those facets, but we, we do understand this is a broad um, economic development, preservation, promotion program. and and um, we're, we're trying to serve Utah's communities as best we can with the Main Street resources. Does anyone else have questions? We've got two more minutes. Yeah, this is Brian Hewlett and Pace. And when is it, when is it gonna be opened up again that uh, new communities can sign up for the Main Street program? Great question, Brian. We, we don't have a date at this exact moment because we, since we are transitioning the program from NAN and GOEO, over to cultural and community engagement. We just wanna make sure we are, we are taking care of everything that already exists before we open that portal, but it's, it's on our minds and we hope to do it as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you all for joining us today. And I want to thank all my colleagues from CCE for taking time. And I'll turn it back over to Nan. Great. Thanks, Tracy. And absolutely thanks to everyone uh, for your time and especially to our partners at DCCE. Um, great information. I actually do have one last quick question. Um, and I think it is for, let's see. Um, Mike Moon. Um, Mike, I think it would be a great addition to the Main Street program to learn a little bit more about the um, support that your office provides for volunteers. So I'll be following up with you and I'll push that out to all of our communities. I learned a lot today as well. Thanks, Nan. Look forward to it. You bet. So with that, last call for questions. Going once, going twice. Yeah, and I, I see one from Rachel in the chat about if these monthly webinars will continue. We're we're not entirely sure, um, but I would plan on a small break as again as we as we transition the program and and get our feet under us, and then but we will keep you all very informed about the program offerings as as we move into the next. It's our fiscal year, the next fiscal year for us. But as we pick up that program and plan for the future. Great, thank you. And with that, um, have a great rest of your day, folks, and thank you for participating. And as I said, the recording will be up on the business.utah.gov slash rural webpage. Thank you all. Thank you.